It's Psalm 117. And let us recite as if we mean it. <laughs> Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you and praise you for gathering us together this morning. You are the Lord over this universe. And it is such a privilege to be called your children. As your children, we raise our arms to you. We praise you, we thank you, and we are looking forward to receiving you, receiving from you this morning spiritual nourishment so that we can go about our week knowing that you are God and that you are in control. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Good morning. Please join me as we sing, I love to tell the story. Oh 
Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning again. We're glad that you're here with us. I want to welcome you to First Covenant Church and also to those who might be joining us online this morning. We welcome you as well. Just want to bring your attention to a few uh, announcements this morning. Uh, the first one is we'd like to let you know, that, and we've been telling you a couple weeks now, that we are going to be having an annual meeting right following this service uh, this morning. So right after the service, I think at 1130, we're going to be starting that meeting. Um, and hopefully it won't be too long. We just got a few items of business, business to go over, and we'll be distributing our annual reports uh, for you to take a look at. So if you could uh, stick around and be part of that, that would be great immediately following the service. Uh, the other announcements we'd like to bring to your attention is uh, we do have a member of our congregation that is in need of some assistance. Uh, they need some help with uh, hauling some things at the dump and cleaning and maybe some minor repairs. So we're going to have a work day uh, next Saturday, the 29th, uh, so we can, our church body can help out meet the needs of that person in our congregation. So we're going to be meeting in front of the church at 9 a.m. and heading to this person's home. We're planning on working till about three, so uh, bring a lunch with you if you can, if you want to be there the whole time. If you just come for part of the time, that's great too. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions and need some more information, please contact John or uh, Laura Morris, and they will uh, give you the information on that. So come be a part of that. And that's all the announcements we have for this morning. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for this day and for this beautiful, uh, warm day, sunshine. But we also come in with our own personal clouds. Someone is struggling with uh, finances, relationship, health issues, and this bright day doesn't seem so bright. Lord, we pray that you will walk with those individuals that you will clear their clouds a little bit so that they could catch a glimpse of the good life that you have in store for us, a life that only possible in, in relationship with you, O oh God. We pray over our world that you will put an end to this COVID. We pray over our world that all the sickness, disease, all the unrest, political, whatever, that you will heal our world. As we worship you this morning, we worship in faith and hope that you are a good God who will take care of our every need. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please stand to your feet and let's worship our Lord.
this time, we'd like to dismiss our children for Children's Church. So if you're preschool through fifth grade, come on forward, and we will dismiss you with your teachers. But uh, let's go ahead and pray for these children before we send them off. Great group today. Come on down. <laughs> There's Gabe. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these wonderful children, Lord, and what a special blessing they are to us and to you, and we just pray for their time today as they go to learn about you and the love that you have for them, Lord, that you'll just bless their time. Father, that you'll be able to touch their hearts with your love, with your grace, and Father, just be with these teachers as they uh, teach these children about you, Lord. Just give them the wisdom and the love to share with them. We pray this in your name. Amen. Also at this time, we'd like to pray for our offering this morning, so if you will pray with me once more. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've given us, Lord. We can't even begin to repay you for all that you have blessed us with, Lord. Um, and Father, we just uh, take this time to thank you for those resources and pray that you will uh, just put it on our hearts as we see fit, as you see fit, to uh, guide us in how we can bless this church and continue its ministry here in the community, and in the world. Father, just thank you for uh, all that you are. And Father, I know that you don't need our resources, Lord, but uh, it is our honor to be able to um, just be thankful and give back just a little bit of what you have blessed us with. So we thank you for that. We praise you in your name. Amen. I have the privilege of reading our scripture this morning, which is found in Acts 1, verse 8, and also Acts 8, verse 1 through 8. A lot of eights. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness, witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Saul approved of their killing. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father God, as, you, as we open your word, let your word sink into our hearts and uh, transform us, that we may not just be hearers of your word, be, uh, but be doers. Lord, uh, bless this moment as we study your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, you know, growing up, and even now, I struggle with English grammar and punctuation, we had a book called Ren and, Ren and Martin. It was a red book used by uh, British officers who uh, lived in the India. But the English school, uh, Indian school system embraced that book. And it had no pictures, nothing to entertain you with. It was just pure grammar. They didn't care. See, we live in a culture where, yeah, I look at the math books these days. They have pictures and, you know, uh, and entertaining. Rain and Martin didn't have any of that. It left me with childhood trauma. <laughs> but when it comes to grammar and punctuation, it matters. For example, if you uh, look at this days in, a uh, signboard, it's a days in some place. It says, we remember all who have served hot breakfast. <laughs> and I didn't realize serving hot breakfast was such a heroic act. 
that sausage, biscuits and gravy and eggs. Man. See, if someone 2,000 years later would read this, they would think that there was a time in America uh, that they honored hot breakfast servers. <laughs> See, this is why punctuation matters. This is why grammar matters, because there should be a period after the word served. The same is true when it comes to studying the Bible and the New Testament, that grammar matters. And this morning, we are going to look at the word go from Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where Jesus says to the disciples, go and search carefully. Oh, sorry, go, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go. We are going to spend some time talking about the word go, what it means, and the implications of that word go. See, when you read the word go in English, it's quite clear it's a command. It's not a divine request. It's not a divine suggestion. It is God's command to us to go. But when you come to the Greek... As many of you know, New Testament was written in Koine Greek. The word Koine means common Greek. What that means is that it was an everyday language. God is a missionary who loves to talk to people in ordinary language. That they would understand what God has to say. So New Testament was primarily written in Koine Greek, the street language, common Greek. It was, it, it was different from classical Greek that Aristotle, Plato were used to writing. And it's different from uh, our uh, contemporary Greek. It's Koine Greek. It's something that Jesus uh, uh, grew up with. It's something that Apostle Paul and others were so used to, street language. So when you look at this word go in Greek, it's a participle. Any English uh, grammar teacher here? Oh, whoa. <laughs> I'm in trouble. It's a participle. What that means is that it ends with an I-N-G. Ing, standing, going, sitting, a participle. So some scholars would say what Jesus is really saying here is not go, but as you go, or as you're going, or when you go. That changes the meaning of the word go. It implies as if Jesus is saying as you're going about your life, Make disciples. Not necessarily Jesus is saying that go to other countries. He's saying as you are going about or when you go about your life, make disciples. And that changes the meaning of the word go. It is as if Jesus is saying, I know you guys are busy. I know Keith and Kelly, you guys have a lot of things to do in life. You are busy 24-7. But as you're going around your life, could you make a few disciples? You know, if you remember. <laughs> if that's the meaning of the word go, then guess what? The missionaries for hundreds of years have understood that word wrongly. If the meaning of the word go is as you go about your life, then William Carey, a British missionary to India who spent some 37 years there, lived and died there, died for nothing in India. He could have stayed in England, could have drank his English tea and ate his muffin and be happy and could have gone around making disciples as he did other stuff as well. But no, there's a problem with translating the word go as as you go or as you're going. You see, this participle, as Jean would tell you, is married to a verb, which is a commanding word. And 
it's grammatically impossible to translate this word as going because it, it is preceded by an imperative. Make disciples. What is an imperative? It is a commanding verb. It tells you something like it is imperative that you do. So this verb, going, is married to this imperative, which is make disciples, and that changes everything. It's like when you're following your wife. You might be a participle. <laughs> oh, honey, as I go about, I'm going to get the trash sometime. But your wife is imperative. She's like, no, you're going and taking the trash out right now. That changes your mood. It doesn't matter your participle. You take on your wife's mood. That's what's happening. Hey, Jean, don't you wish someone like me was a grammar teacher at school? But here's the thing. That's the structural issue, that here, even though you have a participle, it is preceded by this command, and it took on the mood of that command or the imperative. So it is no longer translated as as you go or when you go, but as go. Give you another example, Matthew chapter 2, verse 8. Here you read, go and search carefully for the child. That's what King Herod says to uh, the Magi's. The word go is the same word in Matthew 28, verse 19. A participle. But the word search is an imperative. And when they are together, since the search precedes the word go, that go is automatically should be translated also as an imperative. Herod is not saying to the Magi, as you go about your daily life, <laughs> would you go search? No, Herod was a king. He would chop their heads off. Herod is commanding, go and search. And that's exactly what is happening here in Matthew 28, verse 9. It is not a divine request. It is not a divine recommendation. It's a divine commandment. Go, make disciples of all nations. So what, why did I take you to this Greek grammar stuff? Is it because I want you to think how smart I am? No, as a pastor, as a shepherd, it's a burden that I carry that you get to understand the Bible well. That you be biblical in your way of thinking and living. And you would go about the society and you might hear other people saying, oh, Jesus didn't say really go to other nations. What he's basically saying as you're going about your life. And then you can say, no, this is not true. As I heard Grammatically, even though that is a possibility, but since it is preceded by an imperative, it's a command. Jesus gave a command to go. And we need to understand what this going means, what the command, what this command implies. First of all, what this going or go means is that it is not about being a welcoming church. In the Midwest, I saw this church that had a sign outside which says, we welcome visitors. That's great. We should be a welcoming church. But welcoming is a passive action. You're waiting for visitors to show up. That's great. But to go is active. It's not just waiting, but going out and reaching people for Christ. Welcoming might require some planning. Going requires intention and the church coming together to plan how to go about evangelizing people out in the community. 
It takes intentionality. It takes planning. It takes, takes putting our heads together. I know churches in this country that every fifth Sunday, what they would do is have a short service, and then they would hit the street and go do works like uh, fix someone's uh, house or uh, clean someone's yard or uh, provide a meal in order to show the community the love of Christ. Their intention is to preach the gospel. Guess what? These churches are planning, are intentional about going. There's a church in uh, Chicago. The pastor, his name is Wilfredo de Jesus. One time he went to the elders in his church and said, I need a, you to approve some money. And the elder team asked, what do you need the money for? He said, to hire prostitutes. <laughs> and the elder team said, that's great. So they approved the money. So Wilfredo de Jesus and his wife rented a limo, went and hired some prostitutes, paid them for an hour or two of their service, drove them back to the church, and there was this group of people waiting to greet them as if they're queens. They did a candlelight dinner for these prostitutes. They served these prostitutes. Why? Because no matter what the world thinks of them, they wanted to show these girls that they are the daughters of a living God. Amen. That's what church does. That's what it means to go, to plan, organize, be intentional about reaching people for Christ and not just sitting in the church waiting people to show up. We can be welcoming church, but Jesus is giving us the command to go. It's active. And it takes the whole church. See, Jesus didn't just give the command to individual Christians. He gave it to the disciples, to the whole church. Sometimes we live as if we are a participle. As we go about individually, we witness to people, we welcome people. And that's great. I know people in this church who are welcoming others to come to, who are inviting others to come to church. They're giving the invitation. They're witnessing. But we cannot rely on individuals, unplanned events, and hope, fingers crossed, that individuals would go and witness for Christ in their community. It does not give us the permission to be a church that is doing nothing but welcoming. I'm glad I would encourage each individual as you go about your life, be a witness to Christ. But as a church, we have responsibility to plan and organize so that we can be a witness to Christ, so that we can go and make disciples of all nations. Take from Kentucky Fried Chicken an example. Do you know they have impossible nuggets now? It tastes like chicken, but it ain't chicken. It's all fried. Their purpose is to sell food, fried chicken, and they are doing everything possible given the change in culture to adopt so that they could sell fried stuff. That's what it means to go, to look at our culture, to look at the shift. What can we do to go and make disciples? It takes the whole church. See, De Jesus, Wilfredo De Jesus, was not the solo pastor who went and did his own stuff. He depended upon the church. He depended upon the church. He depended upon the money given by church members for ministry. He depended upon the elders to approve the money. He depended upon church people to organize the dinner. It took the whole church to make those prostitutes feel as if they are daughters of the living God. 
So when Jesus commands us to go, he is commanding the whole church to go, be intentional about making disciples. But going is also takes us out of our comfort zone. See, staying doesn't take much risk. We can stay in our comfort zone, gather in church, worship, and be all happy. But when Jesus says go, Jesus is saying go out of your comfort zone. Go to other people from other cultures, other walks of life, and be a witness to them. It was not easy for me or comfortable for me when I was pastoring in Indiana and our music director, John Wilkinson, who was a more mature Christian than I was, said, hey, before Christmas Eve service, we are going to go to door to door, knock on the door, invite them to Christmas Eve service and tell them how much they are loved by Jesus. Have you ever done door to door evangelism? It's uncomfortable. You don't know what you're going to encounter. It was very uncomfortable. Some people were welcoming. Some would shut the door on your face. But we did it. It was not comfortable for us as a mission team when, I, when we led the first mission trip to India. We went to this village. It was a very rural village, no electricity, next to the biggest forest area in India across from a river. And we are in that village in the evening after the worship service. It's pitch black. We are coming back, sitting on a flat back rickshaw. You know what the rickshaw is? People uh, ride it like a bicycle while they take people from place to place. So we are sitting and some people were jogging alongside the rickshaw. And I understand the language, the local language. And I hear the storekeeper say, Bag Esheche, meaning a Royal Bengal tiger has come into the village. So I had the decision to make. Should I tell the Americans that a tiger has come into the village? Then I decided, well, sudden death is better than knowing that you're going to die. <laughs> right? Anticipating death is much worse than getting jumped on by a Royal Bengal tiger and you're gone. So I kept my mouth shut. People were closing their shops and going back home, local people, and there we were out in the open, way out of our comfort zone. Wilfredo de Jesus must have been way out of, her of his comfort zone to go hire prostitutes. Can you imagine? You are driving by and you see Pastor Schumit talking to prostitutes. <laughs> what assumptions you might have. But that's the calling of the church. To step out of our comfort zone. And minister to people. No matter who they are. When Jesus said go, he says go. He didn't say go to people you like, people you prefer, people you love. He says go to all people, people you don't agree with, people you do not see eye to eye with, people who are culturally di different, people who are ethnically di different, people who are socially, economically different from you. Go to all make disciples, and going takes stepping out of our comfort zone. It challenges our prejudice. It challenges our way of thinking. Sometimes we get so comfortable in staying, we think this is going to last forever. It doesn't. If you look at the early church, in the early days of Christian church in book of Acts, Jesus had told them to go be a witness to all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And they started off well. They started uh, 
with this notion of serving in Jerusalem, but then they got comfortable. They would meet in the temple, they would meet at home, they would worship, preach the gospel, but then God changed their comfort level. He sent persecution. And you read in Acts chapter 8 that the church was persecuted. And as a result of that persecution, the church was scattered. Some went to Samaria, some went to Judea. As a result, the church was pushed out of their comfort zone. And by the time you come to the ends of the book of Acts, Paul is found preaching the gospel all the way in Rome. There are churches in America that are very comfortable because they are financially stable. They don't have to worry about money. They are comfortable in getting together. And not until something happens, a generation passes away, a generation of giver, when they wake up and go, we need more people. Doesn't matter whether you're financially stable or not. When Jesus said go, he did not say go when you're, finan when you're in financial crisis. He said go even though you're financially stable because that's who you are called to be. Go and make disciples. In your local area and also around the world, there was this great guy. I can't pronounce his name well, but his name is Nicholas Vaughn. Zinzendorf. Nicholas von Zinzendorf said this, missions after all is simply this. Every heart with Christ is a missionary. Every heart without Christ is a mission field. And to reach people for Christ, we have to step out our comfort zone. It also means dealing with our preconceived notions. It also means dealing with our own prejudices. See, what Wilfredo de Jesus did with the prostitute, someone who has strong feelings about sex workers, would not be able to go and minister to them. When Jesus told the disciples go, he was telling Jewish people, his Jewish disciples who had strong feelings against Romans, who were ruling over their country, they thought these Romans had corrupted their culture, polluting their culture. They had strong feelings against Samaritans. In fact, if you look at uh, Gospel of Luke, Gospel of Luke talks about when Jesus was rejected from entering this village, Samaritan village. Guess what? John, the disciple, said, Hey, Lord, you want us to bring down fire and burn down the village? <laughs> really? They had strong feelings against Samaritans. This enmity has gone on forever. But here's the beauty. That's why Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift, of, uh, gift my Father promised, the Holy Spirit. What Jesus is saying, without the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, you'll mess it up. Don't leave. And the Holy Spirit comes on and in John, and by the time you get to Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 15, you read that the same John goes to Samaria and prays for them. But the first, he had to step out of his comfort zone. He had to deal with his own prejudice and strong feelings that he had against Samaritans. That's what going means. It requires intentional planning. It requires the whole church. It requires not just the pastor, but the elder team, but the whole church. Givers, supporters, prayers. So that we could go and make disciples. 
It requires us to step out of our comfort zone. Every Christmas, we celebrate the coming of Jesus. Do you realize what it took for Jesus to come here for you? He was God Almighty. He was in heaven. He had no needs, no suffering. He was enjoying pure joy, but he became one of us in order to give us eternal life. He became one with us. He stepped out of his comfort zone and stepped on this earth because he loved us. That's the challenge. We can sit here, have political debates and this and that, but when Jesus said go, he didn't say go to the Republicans or the Democrats or to this group or that group. He said go, be my witness. Put your opinion aside and love this person so he could come or she could come to know God through me. Be a witness. And sometimes we have lost that. Last political season was horrible. Churches divided, Christians are divided. And you go, what in the world? Happening. When did our opinion become better than our witness? When did our alliance with a certain ideology become more than our interest in saving lives for the sake of Jesus when he said go. Have you seen the movie, Don't Look Up? Anyone? It's political. It has potential to offend you. But when I look at some movies, I look at the spiritual side so I can use it in a sermon. (laughs) See, that's the preacher part. I'm always looking for how can I use. Don't Look Up is about this Big old comet coming down to hit the earth in six months. And these two scientists run around uh, trying to get people's government's attention. The president is uh, around the midterm election. She's all about the election, so she doesn't care. The news media doesn't care because it's not entertaining news to tell people that in six months, the world will come to an end. The big companies making money out of the news. And these two people rushing around, going to everyone and everywhere to talk to them about this coming danger of a comet so that the world could be saved. That's what you and I are about. We have a news of salvation You will have opinions, people doing their own things, but we need to go about with the complete urgency and save lives because the world as we understand it is one day will come to an end. Jesus says go. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. As a church, that's our responsibility. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you and praise you for the honor that you have given us to be our instrument of salvation for this world, for this joy of introducing people to Christ and have everlasting life for the hope of the world. Father God, help us to do it well. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Please stand and join me as we sing freely, freely. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said,
standing for the benediction. Receive benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead.